We thank you that as we base our lives in your life, that we find meaning, that we find significance, that we find purpose, that we find a reason to live, a reason to hope, a reason to have a different perspective than those who are given in to, to grief, given in to giving up. And God, I pray that as we gather here in this place today, that we'd be mindful of this awesome opportunity to worship your holy name. That we'd be mindful of this awesome gift to go to your words that you have protected, that you have crafted, that you have inspired. God, I pray that as we read from your word that you will engage in our lives, that you will use our minds and our hearts to be able to get in touch with you so that we can go out and touch others with your love. God, I thank you for each child and each adult, each teenager. God, each is precious in your sight, and we thank you for the opportunity to to do this life together. God, for those who are new to us today, I thank you for bringing them here. Help them to feel at home. God, I pray for those who have no home, who have no place to lay their head, God, as we have been reminded this morning. Help us to be the loving arms that reach out into our community. God, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your grace. It's in the mighty name and the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it brings me great joy to be at Rabbit Creek Church. I was out last week and I understand the services are great as we learned about what's coming up here in a couple weeks with Cambodia. And so thank you, Henry, for that. And Michelle and Jay and others who participated in that. What a wonderful week that was. I had a great privilege, privilege of going to see family over the holidays, as well as going back to the very church uh, where I was called to preach. And it's a wonderful joy to go back to those places where you find your roots, places where you know God's been working in your life. And it is a wonderful occasion as I sat on one side of the auditorium, looking to the other side, knowing exactly where I sat when God called me to preach, and to look back years later and say, that's where that happened. I I take that as a reminder, give you a reminder to to go back and have those moments of of Mark. Some of you may have grown up in places where you sang, sang the hymns, and you came across a hymn about raising your Ebenezer, and you had no idea what you're talking about when you sang it. Raise my Ebenezer. That raising of Ebenezer was something they did in the Old Testament where they gathered rocks and stacked them up. That Ebenezer was a reminder that God did something great there. And so to cling to your Ebenezer, to, to build an Ebenezer is to say this is where God did something. And I was reminded of that this past week. This is where God did something in my life. And I want you to go back just for a moment now to those moments. Maybe, maybe they're not ge- geographic locations. Maybe they're memories. Maybe they're relationships. Maybe it's something you say, you know, God did something in my life at this point or at this location. And just take a moment thank God for that this morning. I want you to just pray to God individually. Just thank God right now for what he's done in your life and those moments where he's gifted you with them. Thank you, Father. So teachers, I want to ask you a question. Imagine what it would be like if you had more parent volunteers than you actually needed in your classroom. What would that feel like? Leaders of service organizations, Chosen, Virtual Behavioral Health, Church of the Nations, what would it look like if you had more people lining up to volunteer than to be served? Church, what would it look like if people came in droves to serve Jesus Christ as we went out to serve others in his name, not having to pull out of people saying, would you please, and would you please, and would you please, but people say, can I please, can I please, can I please. Now, for any of us in any of those illustrations, we say that may take a lot of imagination. Teachers will say, I've never been in a spot where I've had more volunteers than I've needed. And service organization leaders have never said, I've had more people coming to say, how can I help, than people wanting help. And churches rarely are able to say, we have all that we need all the time, even more so. And that can be fictional. That can be something that we would long for. But I want to take you back to a moment in Israelite history where this actually took place. 
Where there was such an outpouring of love and generosity. Where there was such an outpouring of people saying, God did this for me. And therefore, I'm going to celebrate God with my generosity. This actually took place. And we find this in the book of Exodus. And let me give you a little background of the book of Exodus so we can lead up to this. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know this is the second book of Scripture. We need to go back to Genesis and know that that word Genesis means in the beginning. All things were created by God. God set things in motion. And God continued to keep life, sustaining life. And out of life, he crafted and formed a chosen people, the Israelite people, who were oppressed, who were enslaved. And then God brings this man named Moses, a Jew himself, raised as an Egyptian, bringing him back to his people and says, I am going to keep my covenant with your father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses, you're going to be the one through the power of God to bring these people out to help them exit the land of Egypt. And therefore, we have the name of the second book, Exodus. Exodus, they're exiting Egypt. They're going across the Red Sea and ultimately, 40 years later, across the Jordan. But here they are, ready to leave, and they cross the Red Sea, and God gives Moses this great gift. God appears to him, although veiled, Moses is in the presence of God, and God says, Moses, I have a gift for you. I have a gift for you. And Moses, here's the gift, is the law. Now, a lot of times we hear the word law, and we don't think that's much of a gift. But imagine a world without law. Imagine a world without things that tell us how we should live and directions we should go and what is God honoring and what is not. And so God sets this thing called law, the covenant of God in motion. And in this, in this giving of the law, God says to his people, I know that you need a reminder on a regular basis that I am in your presence. Nahum Sarna, now deceased Jewish theologian. If you ever want to know modern theology of the Jewish people, Nahum Sarna is a great source. He's a, he's a Hebrew who, who studied Jewish tradition, Jewish himself, and he put him back, himself back in this day. He has great commentaries in the book of Genesis and Exodus. And in, in his one on Exodus, he talks about this. He says that the, what the people needed was something they could see and a tangible reminder that God dwelled in their presence. The Jews needed a tangible reminder that God was in their presence. You can imagine why they needed this. They have been enslaved for 400 years. They've been driven out of their land, although, yes, a great drive into a new land. But now they're into a place where they, although were slaves, they had all they could eat. Although they're slaves, they didn't have to worry about whether they were going to rise up the next day and be secure from those around them. They had protection. They had food. They had room and board, if you will. But now they're out in the desert, and they're scared. They're hungry, they're thirsty, they're grumbling. And God says, I know they need a reminder that I am with them. And so God says, Moses, I am going to have you give them a reminder, and I'm going to do this through you. And so I want to go to Exodus chapter 25. And you're going to hear a word that often these these wonderful words that become part of our faith start off as very simple words. So just as the word church to us, we, we think of a religious gathering. The word church literally means it's a gathered people. A gathered people. But we're going to hear the word tabernacle. And that simply means a tent of dwelling. So we hear the word tabernacle. The actual Hebrew word there means a tent of dwelling. So picture a large tent, which the tabernacle was. And it's a dwelling place, symbolically, for God among his people. Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 1 says this, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, the onyx stone and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastplate. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle, this dwelling place, and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. What I like about this is you have this very specific description of what God wants. I don't know about you, but I love clarity. 
I love when people say, here's what I expect, and therefore I know if I'm living up to that expectation. When I was a student for all those years, I loved the professors who would say, here is what you need to do in order to do well in this class. I did not ex experience joy for those who just said, well, good luck in these journeys. But to have somebody who said, here is actually what you need to do, that made sense to me. I'm a person who likes order, I like structure, I like routine, and sometimes that can be annoying to people, I know. But if you're one of those people who likes this, you like this type of description. Here is what you need. Here is what I expect, is what God is saying. And I want us to go to 10 chapters later and see the response. So you go to chapter 35, and we're going to hear these words in verse 4 through 9. So Pat, here is the response. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx and stones, and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastplate. This is fact that Moses took good notes. And Moses said, I want the people to clearly know what God said to me. And so Moses takes good notes, and we could cut and paste in modern technology from chapter 25 into chapter 35 so the people hear what God actually said. Now go a few verses down into verse 29, and you find out what happens. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord, through Moses, had commanded them to do. Within 10 verses of chapter 35, you see this repeated word, four times to be exact, the word willing. The word willing. I want you to look at this phrase, particularly out of verse 20. It says, then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence. Now, hold on to that for a second, and let's back up in our minds and see what Moses is doing. And I love this. God commands Moses to do something, and Moses faithfully carries out this command. The command is this, go and prepare a tabernacle, and prepare the people to prepare this tabernacle, and tell them how to prepare for this by giving very specific instructions on what is needed in order to prepare this tabernacle, this place of dwelling, this spiritual place where God symbolically will be with his people, with the Ark and the Covenant and the Holy of Holies and the presence of the angels, and God is going to be there. And so Moses is faithful in carrying this out. God is saying, Moses, do this, command this. And he says to Moses to include something in this as he passes this on. And here's what Moses does. What Moses could have done, which would have been unfaithful to God, but we've seen Moses do that a couple times. What Moses could have done is he's gone, gone to the people and said, God says do this. And tell them what to do, period. God says do this. Bring the onyx. Bring the dyed fabric. Bring the gems. Bring this. Bring this. God said it, Period. But here's what it says in there. God told Moses to say this, and therefore Moses says it. He says, everyone who is willing. Now put that back up again on the screen about the fact that they went away. And the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence. Many, many years ago, the first time we lived in Alaska, Vonda Kay and I got an invite for a free steak. You know what's coming next, right? Free steak dinner. Free steak dinner. Only the Christmas tickets are free in life, nothing else. So I we went to the steak dinner, and we had to say I lost count at eight. At the eighth time, I said no to buying a timeshare in Mexico or Hawaii or wherever it was. Now, what's the rule? If you're a salesperson, you want them to sign a line before they leave the room, right? If you are a good salesman, which I am not, but if you're a good salesman, you're going to keep that person in your room until the person signs a line. You will bend over backwards within reason to get them to sign on the dotted line. So there is this sense of mystery, the sense of awe that, wow, you can't miss this big deal. You can't do this. And some people do this in church as well. 
Whether it be salvation or I could guilt trip you into saying, look at all these great needs and we're not going to lock those doors until we meet the needs. That actually is done. I've seen churches where they take offering two or three times until they just collect all they need to collect. We don't do that at this church because we understand that there's something about the power of a person's willingness. There's a power about a person's willingness. I just read an article this morning in the paper. And it was a brief commentary, and it talked about how we, America, we, are, are some of those generous people for about two months of the year. And then it all goes out the window. We're some of those generous people for two months, and then it goes all out the window. That's a very summarized version of what I read. And, and I thought how apt that was to read that this morning, knowing what I was going to be talking to you about from God's Word today. Is there's this willingness, and I love this fact that they left Moses' presence. Here's what happened. Go home and sleep on this. Go home and think about this. Go home and pray about this. Go home and understand, what is God doing in your life? Where is that Ebenezer moment? Where is that thing that took place? Where is that memory that says, yes, God is good to me? Moses avoided, in other words, this hard sale. Moses avoid, avoided saying, here is what you must do. Do not leave until you do it. Notice another verse, another phrase. It says, everyone whose heart moved him, came and brought an offering to the Lord. Everyone whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to the Lord. A church family, Rabbit Creek Church family, serves people, teaches people, encourages people, invites people to give their everyday ordinary life to God as a sacrificial offering so that they can live This life God has called them to live. And we do this together. And it goes so well when people say, I'm doing this because my heart drives me to do so. Because you and I know that commands and guilt last only so long. I I can can skirt around those easily. I, I can say, well, God's not talking to me on that one. I can say God's talking to this person. But we say, what is God doing in my life? How is my life being moved? How is my life being changed. Look at chapter 36. Here is the response. So Beelzel, Ahilab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary or to do the work just as the Lord commanded. Then Moses summoned Beelzel and Oaliab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. Pause there for a second. So what God has done is he's allowed Moses to find the people who are skilled. This is another great thing. Is God says, I have given people abilities, and we need to honor that as well. We need to see people with abilities and go into those areas of ability and say, we bless you with this. Because God has crafted people differently. And, and that is why no church does the exact same ministries. And that is why you don't ask a person skilled in one thing to leave that skill and go into another thing. Maybe temporarily in a moment that someone needs to step up to the plate. But when there's an area of ministry that fits the DNA of the person sitting there, then that person is the one for the job. That is why we do things as a church that go around a person who says, I'm an advocate for this. I'm a person for this. Leslie is an advocate for chosen. Right? This is the kind of thing we're talking about. That's someone who says, I love this. This is my passion. This is my very much at the core of what I care about. Adams and Monrads are saying, we love Church of the Nations. These people need socks. And so our church says, these people have a love for this. Let's get behind them and help them. Henry and Jane, as they came to this church, had a great passion for Cambodia. I barely could find Cambodia on a map before they got here. And now I know exactly where Cambodia is. I've been there two times. I'm going next year. How did that happen? We have an advocate for Cambodia in our church. This happens when people say, we have skill. But guess what? Not everybody has that skill. Not everybody's going to fly thousands of miles in two days. Not everybody is going to be be able to get their hands dirty, literally constructing a place where we can have a coffee shop and a ministry of worship. Not everybody can do these type of things, but everybody can do something. And listen to what others did as well. 
And the people continued to bring free will offerings, morning and morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, These people are bringing more than enough for doing the work of the Lord commanded, the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do the work. That's one of those passages you have to read like two or three times to make sure that's actually in the Bible. That just doesn't happen. That just doesn't happen, but it did happen. Think about this. They said, here is the goal. We want to build a place where God will be in our presence symbolically. And so, folks, I'm not going to put you, I'm not going to put a pen in your hand and make you sign. I want you to go home. I want you to pray about it. I want you to sleep on it. I want you to go and see what God wants you to do. And lo and behold, they come back. And what does it say? Morning after morning after morning, they just keep coming. And they keep coming. And they keep coming. And Moses finally says, whoa, we've got enough got enough. Moses wasn't about stopping coffers. What Moses was doing is saying, we need to, we need to recognize that God has provided, that God has provided the way that God has moved in his heart, in your heart, in each of our hearts. And this is what happened with the Israelite community. I love this fact because as we look at this passage, we see this other great thing. It says at the very beginning of, or end of verse 7, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. One of the things is a passage that we may misunderstand in Scripture. Since, since, since most of us aren't farmers, uh, that is that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. What does that mean? It's not a mathematical equation. It's not even really talking about cows or hills. God's not in the cattle business. God is in the provision business, if you will. God says, here's what I want done in my world, and the way I'm going to accomplish that is through my people, Israelites, now people who are children of Abraham because of faith in Jesus, his chosen people, that we will carry out his work by what he provides. And so you have a skill, and I have a skill, and sometimes those skills overlap, and sometimes they don't. And don't, excuse me. But we come together, and we see that they form together in a beautiful symphony. And as this happens, we see people bringing gifts and energies and prayers and finances and the ability to do things that maybe only you can do. And this happened. So church, I want you to think about, as you look at the proposed budget for next year, as you think about what we're going to do in Anchorage and Alaska and in the United States and in the world, I want you to think about how you can fit into that. My wife and daughter are going to be joining eight other people from this church, minus one. I'm going to get to that minus one here in a second. And they're going to be going in two nights to Cambodia to serve a people with love and grace, to, to go to our other campus where people are coming. How many were there last week, Henry? 94 people were hearing the gospel of Christ last week in Cambodia because of your prayers and because of your giving. And because Sonny has been called to lead that group. That's nearly 100 people, folks. Maybe you still like, oh, I can't find Cambodia on a map very easily. But think, think about this. Let me tell you about that other one I mentioned. It's my father-in-law. I was just telling some folks this morning. Uh, my, my father-in-law is just retired from dentistry. He sold his practice a few months ago. He's been a Christian for many, many years. Been a faithful church member for many, many years. He's over 70 years old. And part of the ministry that they're going to be doing on this trip is a dental ministry. Now, it helps if you go on a dental ministry to bring a dentist, right? You know, the rest of us can hold mirrors and you know, clean up things, but you actually need a dentist to do dental things. Well, as I said, my father-in-law is a retired dentist. He's 70-plus years old. I won't give you the exact date. 
But he's 70 plus years old, and he's a dentist, and this is his first ever mission trip. Why is he going on this mission trip? Two reasons. He's asked. Maybe another reason his daughter asked him. <laughs> and his granddaughter's going on the trip. Don't overlook those reasons. There's another reason. Because this fits. This fits. That's his skill. He spent many years in school and many years in practice working in people's mouths. And so when we say we need somebody working people's mouths, guess who's going? The man who can work in people's mouths. I want you to think about that as an example of when God says from this stage or from a small group or from some other place that you hear and you hear, wow, that sounds like me. That sounds like something I can do. I can look in people's mouths. I can build walls. I can feed the hungry. I have compassion for the child who needs to be adopted. I have compassion for the people who are on the street and are homeless and need warm socks. I am compassionate about reaching into Alaska villages and say, we love you. If that fits you, do it. The worst thing we can do in the church is to say, that's someone else's job. You find out what your job is, what you're excited about, and you do it. And then we all come together, and we bring what? Our prayer and our finances together to support all that. Our prayer and our finances is everybody's job. And then those craftings, those special gifts, are some of your jobs. And we do this together. I want to share a passage here from the very end of Exodus. I love the way Exodus ends. There's some parts of the Bible I don't like the way they end, but I'm not going to take that up with God. But I, but I like Exodus. I like, I like the way it ends. It says this. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar and put up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. In the cloud, here's what happens. They've built it. And what was the purpose for it? A dwelling place for God. People prayed. People gave more than enough. And tw about 22 months after the request it's completed. Check this out. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, when the, wherever the, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. This is a wonderful testimony of how God is able to do all that he does, and he invites us to be a part of this. It is no coincidence that after the word finished, appears in that verse, it says, and then the cloud of the Lord appeared over the tabernacle. Moses could not enter. In other words, God's holiness was on that place. When we come together and find our skill sets and we use them for God, we come together and pray fervently for the work of God to be done. When we come together and say God is given and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and some of us own some of those cattle and so we're going to bring those finances and say, God, here you go. Then we come together we come together and we accomplish great things. Great things. And one of the things that we want to recognize is that God has provided. Tabernacle. With them, their whole journey. Years later, a man named David comes. It is his dream. It is his vision to build a temple. And that temple will be built Again, by the faithfulness of the people. And what brings, brings him into this delightful moment, David that is, is he says, I am bringing an offering. I am bringing an offering because the Lord has sustained me. Psalm 54. The Lord has sustained me. And there I am bringing a free will offering. What's your gift? What has God given you? What is your skill set? What are your finances? What are your prayers? What are those things that you can bring before God and say, as God has laid it upon your heart, come and do likewise.
at this point, rather than picking up an offering, at this point, rather than giving you something to sign, at this point, rather than asking you to sign up to volunteer for anything, I want to do as Moses did. And I invite you to leave this place today and say, I will pray and I will seek God and I will ask God to put on my heart what I can do. And then I'm going to invite you to come back next week with an answer to that question. And that answer to that question, you can share with us and we're going to do the card and we're going to write down what God has laid upon our heart to do next week. But we're going to do that next week. Because what we're doing now is we are saying, here's what God said. Here's the invitation from God. And we are going to go home and pray about it. And so won't you join with me? That's my encouragement to you. That's my challenge to you that you would go and you would pray. We're going to pray also for a special thing that I've mentioned. We're going to have our worship team come up as we prepare to do this. Uh, we have some of the folks who are going to Cambodia with us here this morning. If you are in Cam- on the Cambodia team, would you go ahead and come on down front? I did not warn you I was going to do this. I'm not apologizing for it. If you can go to Cambodia, you can walk up a few, uh, a few steps into the church. Thank you folks for being here. Henry, Jane, Michelle. We have others here as well. John's here. These are four of the ten going. Nine of them from our church, one from Colorado. And I want you to pray with me. Uh, for these men and women, as they go and they work with Sonny, as they go and help with dental work, as they go into to slum areas and show the love of Christ, as they go and work with a coffee shop that is worked, that is filled with employees who have come out of human trafficking and are able to have a new future in their life. A skill. My daughter has learned to make syrups for coffee. And she's going to train these people how to make these syrups. That's, that's a skill set. Whether it's dentistry, whether it's making syrups, whether it's loving kids, whether it's going and bringing the gospel, this is what we're doing as a church. So won't you pray with me? God, I thank you for this body, Rabbit Creek Church. Thank you for all that we're able to do because of your grace and your love. God, I thank you for these among our family who are going to be traveling many, many, many hours to a place that is dear to our heart, to a country that has experienced so much pain and hardship, to a country that is recovering, to a country where the gospel is being preached, to a country where Christians are going and loving those who have never heard your name. God, I pray for each of our team members who are going. I pray this morning for those before us, for Henry, for Jane, Michelle, for John. I pray that you would help each of them to be motivated to serve as you call them to serve. God, that you'd give them the physical energy and the health. God, that you'd give them the eyes to see the need. I pray for Pastor Sonny and his group as they receive us, that that they would feel blessed and know that people thousands of miles away love them and pray for them. Give them safe travels, Lord. And thank you again for this morning where we can worship your holy name. Help us to be generous as you are generous. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray.